Introduction to Titus Author, Date, and Recipient The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to his co-worker Titus. The letter was probably written in the mid-60s AD between Paul's first imprisonment, Acts 28, and his second imprisonment, which is not mentioned in Acts. Theme The letter's theme is the unbreakable link between faith and practice, belief, and behavior. This truth is the basis for Paul's criticism of false teaching, his instruction in Christian living, and standards he sets for church leaders. Purpose Paul had recently completed a journey to Crete. He had left Titus there to teach the new church. See Acts 14 verses 21 to 23. False teachers were already a problem in the church. Titus 1 verses 10 to 16, and the letter focuses primarily on that issue. The description of elders and of proper Christian living appear to be worded for intentional contrast with these false teachers. The content of the false teaching is not fully explained, as in 1 Timothy. There appears to be a significant Jewish element to the teaching. The opponents come from the circumcision party, Titus 1 verse 10. They are interested in Jewish myths and perhaps ritual purity. Paul's primary concern, however, is with the practical effect of the false teaching. They taught ritual purity, but they lived in a way that proved they did not know God. This false teaching would have been welcome in Crete, which was known in the ancient world for immorality. But Paul expected the gospel to produce real godliness in everyday life, even in Crete. In dealing with the false teaching, Paul also provides Titus with a portrait of a healthy church. He describes proper leadership, proper handling of error, proper Christian living, especially important for new believers in an immoral setting in the gospel as the source of godliness. Walt Rogers has an excellent teaching on this subject today. Now, let's join Walt, now in progress. All right, let's talk about that this morning. Um, as I said, this is a, uh, these are letters that Paul writes. They're personal letters that Paul writes to two young men that he has, uh, you know, sent and dispatched to these churches uh, to deal with some issues. And, uh, in fact, um, this word, doctrine, comes from the Greek noun didache. You can... Translate it doctrine. You can translate it teaching. It's the same thing. Really, it's a synonym for truth. And so, it's the truth. Uh, when you look here, you find out, for example, that uh, there was a lot of false teaching going on, both in Ephesus and in Crete. In fact... When you look through these, these books, Paul begins, First Timothy, his letter to Timothy, he says in chapter 1, verse 3, As I urged you upon my departure uh, for Macedonia to remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. The word there, again, is a, a word that means, it, it, it's heteros, it means a different teaching. Guys, when you look, Paul also speaks here multiple times of sound doctrine. And that's a word from which we get our, our English word, hygiene. It's healthy, it's healthy doctrine. It's doctrine that contributes to your spiritual health. And so, I wanted you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Titus. Titus chapter 1 is where we're going to start and mainly spend our time in Titus chapter 2. But... Um, Paul writes here, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Christ Jesus, 
for the sake of those chosen of God or the elect uh, and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness. And so remember, same word, truth here probably, God, uh, uh, doctrine. It's almost used interchangeably with the Apostle Paul. But truth is to transform our lifestyle, guys. It is supposed to promote godly living in our life. Let me read you a couple of things here. Um, when we talk about doctrine, as I said, we're talking about truth, the truths of the scriptures. And so when you, for example, have a systematic theology and we divide it up and we might say, okay, theology proper, what is that? The doctrine of God. What does that mean? Well, it means you take everything the Bible says about the person of God and you bring it together. Or Christology, the doctrine of Christ. You take everything that the scripture talks about Christ, you bring it together. The same with soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, or the doctrine of the church, ecclesiology, or the doctrine of man, anthropology, all these different doctrines. But what it really is, is you bring the truth together. Now, here is an issue that's very important. Somebody brought this up. We, you know, one church might say that they, they believe something. Another church might say that they uh, believe something else. Ultimately, do doctrines have authority for their life, for our lives? Are they binding upon us? Well, it depends on where doctrines come from. If doctrines are, are, are made up by churches or by humans, uh, you know, then they're only going to have the authority that you decide to vest in that particular person. On the other hand, you know, this comes down to the doctrine of Scripture and the doctrine of Revelation. In other words, how did, how did, we, how did we get this stuff? Second Peter, I want to read this to you. Chapter 1, verse 20 says, But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of personal interpretation or one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of the human will. In other words, prophecy did not have its origin you know, by human beings. We didn't get together and decide, okay, we're going to dream up what, what we think God ought to be like, and we're going to write that down, and that's going to become our doctrine of God. It says, men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. So ultimately, the ultimate author, guys, of the Bible is what? Or who, I should say. He's God. God superintended over the writers of Scripture, the apostles and the prophets, in such a way that what they wrote was the very Word of God. That's how the Bible came to be. And so the Bible is a supernatural book. The Bible is a revelation. It is God's disclosure. It is God saying, this is who I am. This is who you are. This is how I want you to live. Yes. And so, yes. in that sense, you know, doctrine should be binding for our lives. Okay? And it should promote godliness. So... If you look in Titus chapter 1, um, verse 10, Paul says, For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things which they should not teach for the sake of... Of, of, of sordid gain. And so, and all these 
all these churches, what happened eventually you had people come in and they were, they became part of the church. They infiltrated the church, but they weren't teaching the truth. When Jude writes, and Jude is the half-brother of Jesus, listen to what Jude says. This is Jude chapter 1, I believe it's verse 3. He says, Beloved, brothers and sisters, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt it necessary to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. So we have this body of truth, guys. It comes from the apostles and the prophets who were God's mouthpieces. They are God's spokesmen. They write. They're collected together. We have 66 books in this, this main book. We call the Bible today are the collected writings of the apostles and prophets. And it, Peter says, man, they were once for all handed down to the saints. That's us. In other words, nobody's still writing the Bible. Our canon is a closed canon. And he says, contend for it. Why? Verse 4, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness, that's immoral living, and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. I wish I could say that only happened in the first century. <laughs> happens all the time, doesn't it? I mean... Right now, we see a, a battle going about, you know, what is a woman? We're not, a, we're not even able to answer that our politicians, it doesn't seem like. I mean, we have hearings every week, and somebody's testifying before Congress, and they're standing up saying, we don't know. All of a sudden, you've got men marrying men, women marrying women. You've got churches who are endorsing this yes. Yes. and it's always something I can remember the uh, you know in the denomination I grew up in back in the 70s when I had first bec become a Christian the battle was raging over the truthfulness of the Bible was this a book that was simply written by men and full of error or was it superintended by God in such a way that they wrote the very words of God and it was inerrant and it was infallible? Amen. Amen. That's a big deal, guys, because it comes down to your authority. And I went to a Christian school for one semester. I wasn't really smart, but I wasn't stupid. And I knew enough to know that the Bible was the Word of God. And when I had professors telling me that there were errors in this book, I knew one semester... I don't need to stay here anymore. And so, sound doctrine is important. Now let's go back to Titus. Verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness. This is why Paul writes primarily this letter. He wants to build up the faith. And I'm not talking here, I think, about just... Um, um, somebody's trust or confidence in God. I think he's talking about he wants to strengthen them in their belief system, this body of truth that we call the faith that was once and for all handed down to us. And think about this, guys. I was thinking this week, 
Paul calls himself a bond slave. Here is a guy, remember, at one time his name is Saul. At one time he is the arch enemy of Jesus. Why is he the arch enemy of Jesus? He's the arch enemy of Jesus because he thinks that Jesus is a fraud. He thinks Jesus is a false messiah. And so Saul takes every waking moment and he dedicates his life to tracking down every Christian he can track down. He imprisons these people. He tortures them to blaspheme. He even has them executed. And the next thing you know, he says, I'm a bond slave of Jesus. My life is given over to Jesus Christ. How does that happen? Well, there's an interesting word that Paul uses over in chapter 3 of Titus. Verse 5, it says, He, God, saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we had done in righteousness, i.e., not because we were good people or righteous people or moral people, not because we, you know, gave ourselves to feed the poor. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration. Amen. What's regeneration? It's one of those theological words. We don't use it a lot. You'll remember the story in John 3 of Jesus going. He has this encounter, I should say, with a guy named Nicodemus who is a religious yeah. rabbi. He is the teacher of Israel, probably one of the most moral men in the nation. And what does Paul say to Nicodemus, this rabbi, at the outset of the conversation. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. Well, this word regeneration is the theological word for being born again spiritually. And in regeneration, God comes to us and He imparts spiritual life to the very core of our personhood. You might refer to it as our soul or our spirit. God implants new life. It's so radical, it, it literally changes us that we become nothing less than what? A new creation. New person. Amen. And so here's Paul. In one second, he is the great persecutor. And the second, the next moment, he's the principal preacher and proclaimer of the gospel, a bondservant of Jesus. What's my point? Regeneration, guys, is the first step which God comes to us, He saves us, but it is a step uh, that begins this lifelong process we know as sanctification, growth in godliness, by which we progressively become more and more like Jesus. Amen. Again, verse 1 he says, for the sake of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness. The gospel, guys, promotes godly living. Yes. Look at chapter 2 of Titus. Paul writes, he says, verse 1 of chapter 2, But as for you, Titus, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. All right, Titus, this is what I want you to tell these people. I want you to give them healthy doctrine. I want you to give them scriptural truth. 
truth is for living. And guys, doctrine is for living. It's not simply such that you've got this mental file somewhere in the back of your mind where when you meet on Sunday morning and somebody wants to talk about the doctrine of salvation, you can talk about it because you know it. It's given to transform our lives. Okay? Now skip down to verse 11. Paul says, for the grace of God. God's grace has appeared. Well, has it appeared? It has appeared in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word Paul uses there is that there has been this epiphany. There has been this disclosure, this revealing. Monday, I traveled to see my sister in Mountain View. I left Bella Vista about, oh, 5.15 in the morning. Went down, caught, what is that, 4.12 to go east to Harrison. And, you know, I'm driving in the darkness. And then sometime a little bit after 6, probably 6.15, 6.20, somewhere in there, all of a sudden, the sun begin to come up over the mountains. It was glorious. Began to light up the darkness. In fact, I pulled over in my car and I, I, I texted some brother in Christ down in North Louisiana. I said, brother, I am driving east in the mountains and the sun has risen God's majesty on display for the grace of God has appeared in the person of Jesus God's majesty on display all was morally and spiritually dark and then Jesus comes Amen. and he lights it up the dawn. okay Bringing salvation to all people. Instructing us. The gospel. Do you know it teaches us? It teaches us. Now again, how, how does this differ from say, every religion has a moral code. Even the Stoics had this moral code. They just said, just do it. Just gut up your, just just gut up, gut it up, and and do do hard things and live right. What's the difference in Christianity? Well, Christianity is different in that those who really know Christ have been born again. There's been this radical transformation in their life such that not simply that they're religious but they have been brought into this living relationship with Jesus Christ such that now before they didn't know him they were separated from him now they know him they have this intimacy with him his life transforms them it's he is the most important person to them. Amen. And His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, comes to live in them to enable them to fulfill their deepest desire. And when you come to Jesus, what is your deepest desire? Sure. To know Him. And to serve Him. And to love Him. Yes. And to bring Him glory. To know Him. That's it. And so, what does it do? The grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. There's an old life. Walt, you can't live the way you used to live. You can't do that anymore. Because now you belong to me. You're a new creation. Instructing us to live sensibly, righteously, godly in the present age. 
Godly is one of Paul's favorite words in the pastorals. He uses it time and time again. He says, for example, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, But flee from these things. Flee from sin, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. He says in chapter 4, I believe it's verses 7 and 8, Timothy, discipline yourself for the purpose of what? Godliness. What is godliness? Give me, give me some input. What does it mean to be a godly woman? Ladies? Ladies. Chuck, you, you got to wait, brother. I want to live for Christ and set up for self. All right. To live a life totally focused on Him. Okay. Okay. Other ideas? And your neighbor as yourself. Yes. Fulfill the first two commandments. Yes. Okay. I want to read you two things that I wrote in my Bible about godliness in the last year or two. Tom Schreiner says, Godliness is a God-centered life. Originating from God's life, being plant implanted in us, regeneration. Its motivation is the fear or the reverence or the awe of God, the fear of the Lord. Its practical outworking is in godly living, Christ-like virtue, the godly man, the godly woman aspires to live a life that pleases God. Godliness is reverence for God, which results in likeness to God. Reverence for God that results in likeness to God, right character and conduct. Godliness is a manner of life that properly reverences God. John Murray writes, The fear of God is the soul of godliness. Godliness expresses itself in moral excellence, righteousness, and holiness as measured by God's law. Now, I don't have a lot of time here. I want to show you two things. But the first thing that I, I want you to see is that this. He says the grace of God has appeared instructing us. I take that to mean the gospel. Yes. Guys, there is such a thing as gospel transformation. In other words, that more and more progressively we become, we take on the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe it was Eugene Peterson said, discipleship is a long obedience in the same direction. The word disciple, manthano, means one who is a learner. And so we enroll in Christ's school. We walk with Him. And as we walk with Him and as we walk together, encouraging one another and building up one another, we take on the character of Christ. Scripture is very important in this. The Bible says, what is it? Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is. Now, how does that, how do you renew your mind? Well, sound doctrine. You got to have it. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writes, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as pastors and teachers um, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we attain to the unity of the faith. 
How do you attain to the unity of the faith, guys? You gather together and you study the Bible together. You see? And you have godly teachers. It's very interesting to me. The first thing that, that Paul writes to Titus, he says, when you go to Crete, when you go to the church there, the first thing I want you to do, Titus, is to appoint elders. And what does he say there? He says, elders who men, and he gives this long list of character traits. This is what a godly man looks like. This is how he lives his life. And then he makes the statement, the only thing that's not a character trait, he says, and Titus, it has to be men who are grounded in sound doctrine so that they may be able to teach the truth and so that they may be able to refute the false teachers. Yes. You see, what we need, guys, first of all, we need living models of leaders, men who know the truth, they live the truth, they're transformed by the truth, and then they teach the truth. We need that. We need to be able to look and say, man, I'm going to follow him because he's following Christ. And I can see Jesus' character in his life. Now, let me point this to you because we don't have much time. Well, first of all, let me, finish, let me finish Ephesians 4. Paul writes here, he wants us to grow up around until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to the measure of a mature man, spiritual maturity, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, as a result, listen, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by tri the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ. In other words, guys... We've got to get God's Word in our lives such that we're able to know truth from error. I have a sweet relative, and she was reading something this week that was filled with errors, but it was written so deceptively, she was having a difficult time discerning that. And so she needed someone more mature to come alongside her and help her. Guys, that's what teachers are for. Now let's move forward. Chapter 2, Titus. Listen. Verse 1 again. As for you, Titus, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Now listen. Listen what he This is sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith and love and perseverance. Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, not enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their, their children, to be sensible, pure workers at home, kind being subject to their own husbands in everything. And here's the motive. So that the word of God will not be dishonored. You see how practical that is? Oh, doctrine's not important. I don't need to know that. Doctrine encompasses ethics. What we believe is supposed to be reflected in how we behave. Yes. How we live yes. our lives. I'm going to read this to you and we're going to close with this. 
because I don't have time to go every in through everything. This is a commentator. He says the, the term older men denotes age, not office. Senior male members are named first as natural leaders. The value of their example will depend upon their moral character. Yes. Yes. Guys, you cannot lead if you're not a godly man. You can't do it. Your life will speak more loudly than your words. Okay. Sober or temperate. It means, first of all, abstaining from too much wine. If you look and you read this book, there was a real problem. You're, you're living in a, an ungodly place, drunkenness, drug abuse. I mean, it looked like Portland or San Francisco where you look and they're just they're le they're lying on the sidewalks. Yeah. Not only does it mean to, to, to be to, to be self-controlled in those kind of things and not go to to excess, but it means to be clear headed, manifesting self possession under all circumstances. You control yourself. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and what? Self-control. Self -control. Okay? Um, Self-mastery and thought and judgment. Sound in faith and love and endurance revealing Christian healthiness in heart and mind. Um... Then he skips down. Likewise, the same kind of deportment is expected in older women. Although the demands on them are related to their own station in life. The basic demand is that they be reverent in the way they live. I.e. godly. The way they live translates a noun denoting a manner of life as expressive of inner character. The adjective reverent basically means suitable to a sacred person. Training of the young women to duty is given not to Titus but to the older women. Qualified to do so by position and by character. Train means to school in the lessons of sobriety and self-control. To be self-controlled and pure forms another pair. Self-control as a duty for all Christians. Pure denotes not only chastity in their sex life, but purity of heart and mind in all their conduct. To be busy at home means to be kind. To be kind designates a third pair. The first describes the many domestic activities of the housewife that she must willingly accept as part of her position as queen of the home. The devoted wife and mother finds her absorbing interest in the innumerable duties of the home. These demand unsparing sacrifice and self-giving and may subject her to the temptation to be irritable and harsh in her demands. Um, and he goes on, and we don't have time. But this is the point, ladies and gentlemen. Sound doctrine is to be lived out. We're not to be cloistered into these little four walls here. But we are to go out into the world as salt and light. Let your light shine before men in such a way as they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Listen.
when the Word of God, when you discipline yourself to learn the Word of God, and you ask the Spirit of God to empower you to live out what you're learning, when you get out in the world, I promise you, I promise you, people are going to see that you are different. And they're going to want to know why. Yes. And it's going to give you an opportunity to say, Jesus Christ is the one who makes me Amen. different. All right. With that, we got to go. Love you folks. You're dismissed.